Tell me about Governor Gore Brown. What kind of character was he? Governor uh, Thomas Gore Brown arrives in 1855 to replace George Grey, and his previous appointment was as governor of St Helena, you know, basically a small island of the, in the Atlantic. So this was a considerable step up for him, and it's hard not to reach the conclusion that he was out of his depth in New Zealand. Um, and also he had very little understanding of Māori, and I think very little empathy for Māori as well. Um, and so he, he was also quite a stubborn figure, and I think you can see that with the Waitara dispute, when he, he basically refused to budge, even when many others pointed out that um, he was wrong to assume uh, that Te Tera had a right to sell those lands by himself. What about his running mate, McLean? Were they similar? Donald McLean came from quite a modest background in the Scottish Highlands, and you know, from a clan system that was not dissimilar for Māori, was fluent in Māori and had, I think, quite a in-depth understanding of Māori society, knew many of the rangatira, had close relationships with them. But he was also the leading figure in terms of crown purchasing, so he, in a way he kind of exploited the knowledge that he had of Māori in order to further the crown's ends. And in, in, the, in Taranaki you see that where um, Maclean is instrumental in advising Governor Gore Brown that Te Tera has a right to sell those lands. And then he's, he's instructed to go back to Taranaki to complete that purchase, but he never does because I think he really knew that that wasn't the right thing to do, that Te Tera didn't have the right to sell those lands by, by himself. And so he basically wanted to be anywhere other than the scene of the crime. And he would have known uh, the consequences of uh, that purchase. He knew, he knew that I think that there was going to be some kind of impending showdown as a result of that because what happened with the Waitara Purchase was something completely new because previously um, it wasn't the usual practice to purchase land from individuals, especially when the rest of the owners disputed that. And so the notion that Te Tera could sell those lands on his own without the consent of the leading rangatira of the community and the, and the rest of the people of Waitara was something new and shocking for Māori. So up until 1860, the Crown and land agents had been purchasing from collectives rather than individuals. Yeah, I mean, it, the, through the 1850s, you do see um, a kind of slippage in, in Crown practices, especially as there's increasing Māori resistance to selling land. And so... McLean does start to resort to more underhand tactics and you see various disputes breaking out as a result of that. Um, but Waitara was kind of taking this to the next level and it was seen by Māori throughout the country as something that was quite shocking, which was why this was seen um, as much bigger than simply a Taranaki issue because for many rangatira around the country they thought if it can happen there, it could happen here as well which is why there was a great deal of sympathy for Wurumu Kingi Tarangatake's stance. We know that Waitara was a, a thriving community for Te Atiawa Māori. What was New Plymouth like? Well, the, the settlement of New Plymouth had been formed in the early 1840s and the settlers had purchased you know, lands from the New Zealand Company unseen and had travelled to the other side of the world expecting this huge expanse of wonderful fertile lands, and they arrive really to find that the the company doesn't actually have title to the lands, um, that those transactions are disputed by Māori, who didn't accept the notion that, that they had sold this extensive tract of land. Um, the New Zealand company deeds were hugely problematic and, and really not worth the paper that they were written on. So these settlers are essentially confined to quite a narrow strip of land in and around New Plymouth and, and grow increasingly frustrated at that. And so there's this pressure that builds up on the Crown to provide further lands for those settlers. And so from the mid-1840s, Waitara is seen as an ideal place to acquire further lands. And, the, you know, Wurimu King, Tarangatake and others who were living at Waikanae at that time uh, are asked repeatedly to sell Waitara. But 
you know, he, he says time and again that Waitara is not for sale, they will not part with those lands. And so what happens in 1859, 1860 is not something new. It, this has been going on for more than a decade. What kind of settlers were arriving in New Plymouth at that time and how were they living? Well, the, the, you know, the population of a few thousand people and um, some of them um, who went on to, became, to become quite prominent families, such as the Atkinsons and the Richmonds. Um, and, um, you know, so New Plymouth is, it's a settlement that's frustrated by the fact that they don't have, or they, they deem that they don't have enough land um, to farm. So th there is this pressure, intense pressure, that builds up through the 1850s as a result of that. Just picking up on, on something you were, you were saying there, uh, the pressure uh, for land had become immense. Would they have known or would they have respected the decisions that had come out of Manawapo just a few years earlier to not sell any further land, a collective decision? Well, for many Pākehā, the, the Manawapo hui is seen as the start of a land league um, and it's seen as a threat to this desire to acquire further lands and the assumption is that people like Wiramu Kingi are, are really exercising a kind of veto over the rights of other Māori to do what they want with their lands and you see this intense pressure through the 1850s building up. In 1854 you have the Pukitapu feud that breaks out where there are a number of casualties as a result of efforts really to exploit any any divisions that the Crown can find within Taranaki Māori, um, so looking for Māori who might be willing to sell lands a a and pursuing those opportunities wherever they can, and that, that creates real tensions. And so people like Wilhelm Kingi are seen as kind of troublemakers simply because they want to hold on to their lands, they won't part with their lands, and that's, that's something that, that is a source of immense frustration for, for many settlers. So around about that time, you know, when Wiremu Terangitaki Kingi uh, was dealing in the way that they dealt with uh, those who were offering their land up for sale, like Rawiri Waiowa, who was shot dead uh, with five others, it was kind of like the law, the LORE or the tikanga that they were abiding by at that time. Would settlers have become fearful with that kind of activity, that behaviour? And there was a call for martial law at the time? Yeah, so I mean, the, there's this, this sense that um, people like Wiramu Kingi need to be kind of brought under the thumb of the law because, you know, Pākehā didn't travel halfway around the world to play second fiddle to people that they regarded as inferior to themselves. So there's this kind of lurking um, Victorian assumption of racial dominance that's also at play here. And how that plays out is in, in this kind of notion that settlers should be in charge because they are at, they're at the apex of their own imagined racial hierarchy and they come here and they discover they're not because people like Wiramu Kingi are still in charge of their own communities and have a great deal of um, autonomy and rangatiratanga. And Wiramu Kingi, of course, was a signatory to the Treaty of Waitangi in 1840. So he, you know, his assumption was that he had been, his right to manage his own affairs had been explicitly guaranteed by the Crown in that document in 1840. Was it around that time that Imperial troops came in or were they already there? So, I mean, you get a build up of Imperial troops come into the country from 1840 and they're in the country through until 1870, the last troops leave, but there is a build up um, and especially 1859 to 1860 as people can see that war is approaching. Te Kohia, the first shots of the war, how would you describe the run up to Te Kohia and that land sale with Te Teira and the, and the Crown? So March 1859, Governor Brown comes to Taranaki, he attends a hui with Māori. Um, te Teira offers to sell land to the Crown. Um, Donald McLean is there and advises Brown that Tateta has a right to sell those lands. And so Brown accepts that offer. The governor later says that um, Wedder McKingy and others hadn't asserted any joint claims to ownership of those lands, which is not true. They, they had done that repeatedly and they had been, had been doing that since the 1840s. 
but nevertheless, um, Brown assumes that um, Deterra has this right to sell the lands. I think McLean knows better, which is why he kind of makes himself scarce after this. Um, but for Brown, this becomes a bigger issue than simply the fate of 600 acres of land um, at Waitara. It becomes really a question of whose will is going to prevail, who's in charge here. So there are these bigger issues around sovereignty and rangatira tanga that come into play um, in the Waitara dispute that Brown says, you know, had he allowed Widamu Kingi to to stop this transaction, then he would have made him virtual sovereign over that part of Taranaki. Which kind of ignored the fact that um, Widamu Kingi's right to manage his own affairs had been explicitly promised in Te in 1840. So Te Kohia happens, what happens there? So February 1860, the British attempt to survey the disputed lands and the owners send out Kuia to pull out the survey pegs, which is seen as a, a way of signalling opposition to the supposed purchase without, without doing that in a, in a confrontational way. And the Crown's response to that really is quite extraordinary because they call this um, an act of rebellion pulling out survey pegs on the ground and they declare martial law over the Taranaki province. And, you know, even then, uh, Widow McKinney and others are kind of pleading with the Crown to reconsider the, the purchase of those lands and declaring their desire for peace. I mean, Widow McKinney was not a man of war. In fact, in 1846, when he lived in the Wellington region, he had kind of assisted the Crown when... Um, he, he'd acted to prevent supporters of Te Hayata travelling to the Wellington region at a time of conflict. So if, if anything, he had been an ally of the Crown in the past, but now he's been branded this, this troublemaker, this rebel, um, simply for attempting to defend the lands of his community. Te Atiawa, I would say that the kuia removing the pegs was a way of saying the land was still in dispute. How do you think the Crown reached the opinion that it was rebellious? I, I think because by that point, Brown had decided that this issue was bigger than simply the fate of those lands. It was about who was going to decide this dispute. And for him, it was a matter of the Crown having to assert its authority over Māori. But the thing is, this was something new and quite shocking for many Māori because... Um, previously, you know, the Crown had been kind of forced to recognise the rangatira tanga of, of, of communities and, you know, Widamu Kingi's role as the leader of that Waitara community really wasn't in dispute. So this is a case where Brown is attempting to deliberately undermine his leadership of that community and to say that the Crown is now in charge and, and Te Atiawa, um, must obey the rule of law. In, in a way that was, you know, quite different from what had happened previously, where the fact that uh, Māori communities still had considerable um, ability to manage their own affairs and that had been promised them in the treaty and so on, previously the Crown had kind of respected that, albeit reluctantly, but here um, Brown had taken things to the next level, really. Almost overnight, Te Rangitake uh, Kingi erects an L-shaped pa te kōhia. Who fired the first shots? So the first shots in the Taranaki War are fired by the British, and that's really quite important because um, following on from that, it was considered that um, the Te Atiawa cause was a just one and that uh, you know, others would then come to their assistance and aid them. And the, you know, there are, almost immediately there are calls, calls for assistance from elsewhere, from Waikato and so on. And so... What happens is the British fire the first shots on the pa, the people inside the pa uh, perform a haka and then they return fire. And the first casualty of the war is a Taranaki um, volunteer called Sartan who they approach the pa when they hear the gun firing has ended and that he attempts to snatch a flag from inside the pa and he's shot and, and killed. Following the call here and the shots, you know, there had been a death was it all on there? Were, would, would the Crown have been rallying their troops for a war? That, well, there was no turning back, was there? Well, you know, the, um, the assumption on the Crown side was that there would be a quick, easy victory. 
And uh, what happened at Tokohia is that um, after the initial exchange of gunfire on the 17th of March, um, at dawn the next morning, the Crown forces approach the par and they, they find that it's empty. Um, and I think all they find is um, a flag and a, and a horn. Um, and so this is, this is a source of immense frustration. And these assumptions of an easy victory um, are kind of, you know, they don't bear fruit. And it's, it's almost like the, um, the British commanders hadn't learned anything from the Northern War. This, this kind of, because Tokohia was one of these modern power, which was, you know, quite sophisticated with anti-artillery bunkers. And it was also something that could be, you know, easily evacuated. Um, and so, the, you know, what you get is this, this uh, constant crown effort to achieve a decisive victory and, and assumptions that that will be straightforward. Um, compared with the the, um, the approach of the defenders, which is is to to frustrate that and to um, to avoid being caught in open warfare, where the superior British numbers and artillery and technology would would come into play. So when Southern Maori iwi started to join Te Atiwa at the Waikato Hills, how would the Crown have perceived that? Well, I mean, this this was. Um, it was clear that the, the conflict was becoming much bigger than simply the fate of those lands at Waitara. And, you know, Māori from throughout the country could see the potential threat to themselves. So when um, Woody McKingie's cause was considered, um, many other rangatira thought that it was a just one. And so there is this kind of rallying of forces. Um, and so, you know, Māori from southern Taranaki come north to join forces. There's a major confrontation on the 28th of March and the outcome of that has been much disputed. The, the British claimed that they had killed as many as 150 Māori, but you know, other sources indicate that the actual number may have been as few as five people killed there. So you know, the outcome of that was, even today I think it's far from clear. I mean, there was this, I mean, what happened is that um, there was a settler force at Omata Stockade um, who were attacked and um, Crown forces come to their aid but then they they comply with orders to return to New Plymouth before nightfall because one of the things here is that New Plymouth was incredibly vulnerable. A lot of this action is taking place either side of it and within quite a close vicinity so you know, large numbers of troops needed to were needed to simply to defend that settlement, and so these troops comply with that order the, and essentially abandon the settlers. Um, but another party um, from the HMS Niger turns up and, and provides relief, and they kind of seem to be the heroes of the day. Um, but as I say, there's a lot. You know, the outcome of that conflict is, is really far from clear. And. Lots of Māori, uh, southern Māori, lost their lives um, and were injured. Uh, they say they retreated to the south and the HMS Niger continued to fire on them. Yeah, so, I mean, throughout the, throughout the war, you do get the deliberate, deliberate destruction of Māori villages and so on. And the British do have, um, you know, warships, artillery, the latest technology. I mean, Britain is kind of the, the leading superpower at this time. And this is asymmetrical warfare where really um, the British have so many advantages in, in terms of their ability to prosecute war. For one thing, um, the Māori who, who fought in the war um, had to feed themselves. They didn't have a, a, you know, a, a huge sort of supply train dedicated to providing them with food and equipment and ammunition and so on. So everything that they used, they had to to bring themselves. So decimating their kai gardens and their cultivations was an act of war, really? Yeah, and it's, it's I mean, really, the, um, the intention is to make these areas uninhabitable. Um, and, and that happens throughout the conflict. Um, there's also, um, you know, a lot of the outlying settlers are also um, forced to retreat um, to take shelter within New Plymouth and 
within New Plymouth itself, you know, the, the conditions there become pretty appalling too over time and you get, um, over the space of a year, about 120 people die of disease and, and illness and so on because of the cramped conditions there. In August 1860, you get an evacuation of women and children. Um, a lot of them go to Nelson. So the way that the war is fought so so close to the settlement of New Plymouth is, is really quite different from a lot of other conflicts um, which take place in, in more remote areas. What happens following Kaipopo? Does Governor Brown halt hostilities? There's a decision made not to immediately um, prosecute the war any further. And, and part of the thing that everybody is, is waiting to see the outcome of is what will Tainui do, what will the Kingitanga do? Because their intervention could be crucial. Um, and there are kind of, um, there are varying reports on whether um, Te Atiawa, the people of Waitara, had um, agreed to to fly the King's flag at their, at their par um, before the dispute over the lands, because if they did, then the, um, the pact that the King and Tonga made to stand together to defend their lands, to defend their people, would come into play. And there, um, there are parties from, from Waikato, from um, the King Country and so on, who, who travelled to Taranaki, um, and some people say they're war parties, but there's other evidence that suggests that they've, they've gone there explicitly to investigate the whiter a dispute and consider the rights and wrongs of that matter. And it's said that they come to the conclusion that um, William McKinney's cause is a just one. Um, and as a result of that, you do get intervention later on, and that becomes pretty, pretty important as the next major conflict. The next major conflict, which is uh, Pukitakawiri and Onuku Kaitara, would be disastrous for the Crown. Hapurona, the general who worked alongside Te Rangitake, did he outsmart the Crown this time round? Yeah, so Hapurona was the military commander of the defeating forces in the First Taranaki War, and it was rumoured that he had been at Ohiowai during the Northern War. And again, you see these quite sophisticated paths that have been constructed um, with a lot of um, things that were intended to mitigate the natural advantages that the British had, such as their artillery firepower. So you have uh, anti-artillery bunkers and so on. At Pukitakawiri, it's this is the first conflict that substantial numbers of Ngāti Maniapoto fight alongside Te Atiawa and other Taranaki Māori. And the British suffer their heaviest defeat of the war. Nearly one-fifth of their number uh, end up as casualties, I think 30 killed and 34 wounded. So it's really quite a humiliating blow and, and following that conflict at the end of June 1860 there's kind of panic in the settlement of New Plymouth and there is this decision made to evacuate the women and children because it's no longer considered safe. And so many of these conflicts are taking place so close to the township itself that the risk is always that there will be an attack on the settlement and that means that a huge amount of resources is, is devoted simply to protecting um, that settlement. Was it a sophisticated military uh, pa, uh, Pukitakawiri and Onuku Kaitara? Yeah, I mean the, the British were kind of um, lulled into a trap really and um, I think it's, in the days before that um, battle, the commander of the, the British forces, um, Colonel Gould, had um, had written to, to Nelson, the officer there, that um, had um, said that he should teach the, native, the troublesome natives a lesson that they'll never forget. But really the outcome of that was, you know, it's really disastrous for the British and it is, it is seen as, as a major defeat. In so many battles, uh, when Māori were outnumbered and had a lesser fighting artillery, it was about uh, tricking their opposition into t to certain pathways or areas. Mm. At uh, Pukitakawiri, can you describe how they managed that and how they uh, had such a victory there? There are two pa in quite close proximity but there were also a number of um, sort of outer pits that um, Māori fired on the British from, from concealed, posi concealed positions in the fern there. 
And, um, you know, for the British, um, they really didn't know what had hit them and um, they suffer a huge number of casualties as a result. It, they drowned? Was it these, these records that they were swamped and... Yeah, there's a lot of swamp land around there and, and it's said that, you know, a number of the bodies of those who were killed were lay in that swamp for weeks afterwards. And this is also seen as a source of humiliation that even those who are killed are not retrieved and, and, and given, you know, a decent burial. What would the impact on the colonial soldiers have been following that defeat? Well, I mean, for Crown forces who assumed that they, you know, were heading for an easy victory, that this is a, a major humiliation. And the fact that intervention from outside was seen to be decisive in that outcome, given the significant number of Ngāti Maniapoto there, is also seen as incredibly important. And that um, assistance that's provided to Te Atiawa is kind of a, a, a turning point in the conflict because it becomes clear, I think, from that point that there, there is no easy victory to be achieved in, in this war. More redoubts were being built and the colonial soldiers uh, would, would have brought more reinforcements in. What was their next move? So following um, the, the defeat at Pukitakawere, um, Gold is replaced as the commander of the British forces by Pratt and he tries another tactic. Instead of this attempt to simply to storm pa, he decides to adapt sapping, which is essentially a much slower, uh, more gradual process involving digging long trenches, tunnelling basically towards the series of pa that Māori have built. And this is, for, for a lot of the settlers who who see this unfolding, they're incredibly frustrated by it because Pratt is seen as being overly cautious. But these, I mean, the sapping operation is, is very effective. And so as they advance further towards the Māori position, at each place they build redoubts. But, you know, it, it takes a long, long time to do this, months and months. How many people would have been involved in digging out the saps? Um, th th there's a huge number of people involved and, you know, the sapping operation is quite a sophisticated one, um, but it's, it's a very, very slow one and, and for people wanting quick progress, they can't see it here and it is, you know, Pratt becomes a target for a lot of criticism for people who are wanting, you know, a decisive battle. They, they want to see a major uh, defeat inflicted on Māori, but th it doesn't happen and, um, so, you know, the sapping operation begins in December 1860 and it's still going in March 1861. So months and months of, of sapping. There is one significant conflict during that time at the, the number three redoubt when Rewi Maniapoto leads a toa attacking the redoubt, which is a very daring thing to do, and they suffer significant casualties as a result of that. But other than that, for months on end, really, you've got kind of this long-range exchange of fire, along with this, this gradual inching towards Ma the Māori position at Te Arei. How effective was the sapping? Uh, three and a half kilometres, they say it was? Yeah, so by March 1861, they'd got within 75 metres of the outer defences at Te Arei, and at that rate, they were quite close to breaching those outer lines. So frustrating as it seemed to many settlers, it was quite an effective system. They were heading for Pukerangi order, uh, the pa sitting there on the hill, but there was a ceasefire. Yeah, so March 1861, the British are inching their way towards the Māori position, and Wurumu Tamihana, the great Natihoa Rangatera, arrives in Taranaki, and, you know, some rumours said that he'd come to fight, but actually Wurumu Tamihana's role was, he was a peacemaker, and he'd come to Taranaki to bring an end to the fighting. And he attempted to negotiate with Pratt. Um, Pratt told him that he, you know, he would go, have to go and speak to the governor if he wanted to negotiate an end to the war. Uh, but then, you know, a little time after this, Donald McLean finally returns to Taranaki, and he does, you know, agree to talk with Wurumu Tamihana. 
And the thing that Wurumi Tamihana asked for is an investigation into Waitara and, and the dispute over those lands. Um, there's not really a clear agreement. There's a temporary ceasefire, um, a resumption of fire, then Wurumi Tamihana um, and, and McLean kind of agree on a ceasefire. The terms aren't very clear, but what happens is, is the next day, um, hundreds of, of Tainui Māori jump on their horses and return home. And so the war ends without a clear victor. Um, and it's far from clear that, it, that the fighting has come to an end. And in a sense, this is really just the start of, of um, nearly a decade long of fighting in Taranaki. What did it mean for Te Rangitake and Hapurona? Well, Te Rangitake, um, he, following um, this, he travelled to, to Waikato, and I think he lived with Rau Manipa to Kihiki for a number of years. Hapurona um, signed peace terms with the Crown um, in April 1861, and one of the things that the Crown did agree to was that there would be an investigation into the Waitara affair. Um, Hapurona and others were supposed to agree to submit to, to British law to return property that had been planted and so on. A lot of these things don't happen, um, but eventually um, Governor Gore Brown, um, following, the, following the Taranaki War, um, he makes this decision that the, the issues that were in dispute in Taranaki, basically about who is in charge, who should decide these, these matters, can't be solved in Taranaki, it has to be resolved in Waikato. So almost immediately he starts planning for an invasion of Waikato. And that's only brought to an end when he's replaced as governor by George Grey. And Grey arrives in the country in September 1861 and immediately concludes that the Crown is in no position to invade Waikato anytime soon. So he, he starts building up Crown forces even further, building the Great South Road, ordering steamers from Australia and so on to do that. Um, so, you know, the the first Taranaki War is kind of, it leads it leads into the invasion of, Tara, of Waikato in July 1863, that this is one of the consequences that come out of this, that um, Waikato Māori, because of the assistance they provided to Taranaki, are seen to have committed an act of rebellion themselves. Would and be punished they would be punished for this. What of the land that was in dispute in the first place, the land that Te Teira had offered up to the Crown? Well, so the new governor, George Grey, who returns for his second governorship, um, he does, you know, conclude this inquiry into the land and, and he concludes that Te Atiawa were in the right that the Crown had wrongfully um, assumed that it had purchased the lands and Waitara is, is returned, but the bitter irony is it's, it's a very temporary um, thing because it's later confiscated by the Crown under the New Zealand Settlements Act, along with about 1.2 million acres of Taranaki land because war returns to the area in 1863. And really that there's continuous warfare, repeated invasions through until about 1869. And, you know, again, with the, the, a sort of epilogue at, at Parihaka in 1881, when that community is also invaded and, and dispersed. Hapurona agrees to the ceasefire, uh, and Governor Gray investigates the land purchase. And can you tell me what he found again? So Governor Gray concluded that um, the Crown had wrongfully pursued a purchase of those lands. Tatera didn't have a right to sell those lands by himself. Uh, Te Rangitake and others did have interest in those lands. And a lot of people, a lot of Pākehā had pointed that out in 1860, so this wasn't new information. Governor Gray attempted to portray this as something that was new, kind of to justify this back down. But privately, he'd been writing for years himself that Waitara was a grave injustice. So, you know, this was, you know, this was widely, what was widely known. But one of the things that, that, the crucial things that happened is he delayed returning Waitara. Um, and meanwhile, British troops had occupied other lands um, at Tataraimaka, which had been occupied by Māori um, 
kind of as utu or as an equivalent for for the lands at Waitara. So that was seen as a provocative act, and that was seen as a resumption of the warfare. And in May 1863, British troops uh, uh, ambushed at Oakura, um, and after that you get a resumption of warfare in the province, and you get, as I say, wave after wave of invasion, and you see, in response to that, you see the Paimarare faith emerging, which is kind of... Um, offering hope for Māori in desperate circumstances in Taranaki. You get um, later occupations and invasions which are conducted in an incredibly ruthless manner. Um, operations where, you know, entire kāinga are indiscriminately destroyed. It didn't really matter whether they belonged to Māori who had supported the crown, opposed it, or simply attempted to to stay out of trouble altogether. And so, you know, the, this is, you know, relentless warfare really is, is being pursued in Taranaki for, for, for many years afterwards. So by mid-1861 there was a ceasefire, an inquiry into the, uh, the Pika Pika block, which was the Waitara land sale. Uh, what did they find and what was, yeah, the consequences? So in 1863, um, Governor Gray announces the result of his investigation is that the purchase that the Crown presumed to have completed from Te Tera was wrongful, it wasn't a valid purchase, and the Waitara lands are returned to their owners. The bitter irony is that that, that return of those lands is a very temporary one because gen by January 1865 they've been confiscated by the Crown um, under the New Zealand Settlements Act and this is supposedly um, in response to acts of rebellion committed after 1863. And the reason the U that the Crown uses this 1863 date is they don't want to link that confiscation to the Waitara Purchase, which is seen, you know, widely as, as something that was incredibly unjust. Did Te Atiawa ever move back onto their lands after it was found to have been confiscated? Well, uh, Te Rangitake um, moved to Waikato and he he refused to sign peace terms with the Crown. Um, and, you know, by 1865, the lands are confiscated, and um, so there's this occupation by, by settlers. Um, and really, the community there is, is kind of dispersed. Um, later, many take up residence at, at Parihaka. Te Rangitaki himself um, spends a number of years at Parihaka. And so, for Te Atiawa, the, the, the consequences are ones that they live with over many generations as a result of confiscation, the loss of their, their livelihood, their infrastructure, their crops, their cattle, their horses and so on, um, is, is something that has profound consequences for them. What became of the 1.2 million hectares of confiscated land? So, I mean, you have military settlers occupying some of the lands, you have other lands sold for profit, and you have some lands that are supposedly uh, returned to Māori. But that process is an incredibly um, protracted and complicated one, and eventually um, you have a West Coast Commission that's established, and um, those lands are essentially, uh, a lot of them, um, are subject to perpetual leases, and including lands at Waitara. And so, you know, the the arguments over over those lands is, is one that is ongoing today and in many in many ways we, we still live with the consequences of the Taranaki War today. For the people of Taranaki, what do you believe the legacy of the Taranaki Wars has been? Well, I think that, I mean, the, the, the Taranaki Wars as a whole were incredibly brutal. They resulted in, you know, a huge number of lives lost and, you know, sweeping land confiscations that were ap applied indiscriminately regardless of who owned those lands. And those are things that, you know, lasted generations. And I don't think that that history has been widely understood or acknowledged, partly because we don't learn about it at school. And, um, you know, we should be learning about that history because it is part of our story and we can't, you know, much as we might like to simply acknowledge bits of our history that we like. We, we also need to acknowledge these darker episodes as well because they are part of us, they are part of our story, they're part of our history. 
For Māori here, they say that the wars have never ended. Taranaki had a very long period of war, longer than many other iwi. Hmm, what are your thoughts about that? Well, I mean, there's an, arg an argument to be made that, that the, the Taranaki wars really um, are, are still ongoing in 1881. I mean, if that's not directly part of the wars, it's certainly part of the legacy um, and part of that process of confiscation and so on, which, you know, is, is one that, that um, endures for decades and decades. And throughout the 20th century, Taranaki Māori seeking the return of confiscated lands, seeking to have their reputations restored. And, you know, there is... As early as 1927, you have the Sim Commission that does conclude that a grave injustice was done to Taranaki Māori um, in the Taranaki War. Um, that commission concludes that Māori were um, treated as rebels and assumed to be in the wrong, regardless of the fact that they had, had done nothing to provoke that. Um, and so, you know, for its era, that's an incredibly strong finding, but it still takes many, many more decades to, you know, to have even a fraction of those lands returned to them. And, and there's still that ongoing dispute today over the fate of those Waitara lands subject to, to, to leases. Following the purchase of Waitara land, then the inquiry, which found that, they, that, that, that the sale had, had been wrong, uh, they handed those lands back uh, and then they confiscated them again. What has become of the Waitara lands today? So many of those lands were subject to um, perpetual leases really at, at peppercorn rentals and that's been a source of a, enormous argument to this day as, as to the fate of those lands with the decision made that the occupants of those lands should have the right to purchase them outright rather than the entirety of those lands being restored to Te Ateaua and, and that, that is a source of ongoing grievance. Is there a case in the New Zealand wars quite like the Waitara land purchase story? Well, it was, it was often said years later that Waitara was the root of all evil and um, Waitara is the start of 12 years of ongoing conflict across all of the North Island and you know there are strong connections with the first Taranaki war and not just the later conflicts in Taranaki but also those in Waikato and elsewhere. So, you know, this is an incredibly important um, moment in history. And the, um, that decision to, to pursue that purchase that was made in 1859, um, it, it's one that has profound consequences for Māori across the country. That kind of act that happens so soon after the Treaty of Waitangi does that make it difficult for you know two peoples to live as one in a town like Waitara? I think so. I mean, and we can see the the Waitara dispute is really about two different understandings of how Māori and Pākehā should live together. On on the one hand, the Crown's assumption that under the English translation of the treaty, the Crown has sovereignty over the country. The Crown is in charge and by implication settlers are as well and that conforms with their notions that they are superior to Māori because that's what a lot of Pākehā, uh, that's what they believe, firmly believe. But that doesn't accord with the reality on the ground where Māori um, are still incredibly powerful and in many ways dominating the economy and in, in charge of their own affairs. And for Rangatira, like uh, Te Rangatake, that, that was their expectation, that they had been promised in Te Tiriti, um, Te Tino Rangatira Tanga, over their lands, over their affairs. And their, their wish, their desire, was to live in partnership and reciprocity with settlers. Um, so it's, you know, you can see the Waitara dispute as a playing out of which one of these ideas is going to prevail? Is, is it this notion of partnership or of crown primacy? Evaluating the Taranaki story, the Waitara story, as a historian and as a New Zealander, what are you left with? Uh, a profound sense of tragedy, really. Um, I mean, this, it didn't need to unfold this way. There were opportunities for um, Māori and Pākehā to live in partnership with one another, but, you know, this is kind of undermined by these 
settler ideas that that they're supposed to be in charge, and um, they need to show figures like Te Rangitake, who's the boss, that it's time that Māori are put in their place, and those those kinds of um, ideas all come to the play in the Taranaki War, and you know the dispute itself, the conflict lasts a year, but its legacy is one that we still live with today. Do you think uh, Taranaki Pākehā living in Taranaki, who have lived here all their lives, possibly farming the confiscated lands of Waitara, have an understanding of the history here? You know, I think it probably a lot of people have heard of Defiti or they've heard snippets of it, but I, I'd imagine a lot of people don't know the full story. They don't know um, the background to that in terms of the, the Waitara dispute or the fact that um, the Crown had been attempting to the, acquire those lands for many, many years, the concerted pressure that was placed on the owners um, to part with those lands, um, really the, the almost fraudulent nature of the New Zealand company transactions that were supposed to have um, resulted in, in the purchase of, of Taranaki lands. Um, and so, I mean, a lot of that history, I think, is not widely known because we don't learn about it at school. Whose responsibility is it to right those wrongs today? Well, I, I mean, I think it's something where um, the the Crown it, it needs to to come on board in terms of making information available to people, making resources available, ensuring Rangatahi learn this history at school, and also looking after the sites, the battle sites that connect us with that history as well, because the uh, tangible reminders of that history and so I think you know for for a lot of Pākehā as well who haven't been exposed to this history um, they need to have opportunities to learn about that history to engage with it to take ownership of that history because it is part of our story whether we like it or not and we do need to to take ownership of this that history um, I think not to make people feel guilty or ashamed about the actions of their ancestors, but actually as a way of healing, as a nation, we, we can only heal if we're honest with ourselves, if we're truthful about our past.